quick introducing my audience. Thank you, thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining me. My name is Jeremy Rally. You have all been invited here today because over the years we've partnered up and problem solved in different capacities as co-workers here at Jackson. What some of you may not know is that I'm also a passionate student working towards my degree in professional communications. Our business, like many others, is hinged on effective communication. A show of hands, who here has attempted to persuade someone at work in the last week? Keep them up. How about at some point today? That's, that's about everybody, okay. The textbook definition of persuasion. Who is it? Oh, one please, there we go. The textbook definition of persuasion is the process of creating, reinforcing, and changing people's beliefs through and actions. We use persuasion every day to campaign for resources, to suggest policy changes, to negotiate salary, or to defend decisions that we've made. And we're not alone. Economists have added up the number of people whose jobs depend on persuasion. <clears throat> Think about lawyers, sales representatives, administrators. These economists concluded that persuasion accounts for nearly 30% of the United States' global domestic profit. Whether your goal is to persuade or just build positive working relationships, like all of these, verbal competence is an important skill to develop in, in order to advance your career. During our time today, we'll get ready, get set, and go through steps required to prepare for the event of public speaking. We'll review tips for maximizing the impact of our content, and we'll wrap up with a lesson or two about getting the most out of our visual aids. So without further ado, let's get down to business. Before the first words are spoken, we need to position ourselves as someone worth listening to. We'll get ready by understanding our audience. Excuse me. We'll get set by focusing on preparedness and then we'll go through tips for controlling our nonverbal communication. First, we need to get ready by aiming for audience-centeredness. This means keeping the audience in mind at every step of your speech, which will ultimately maximize the impact of the overall message. Are you speaking to executives with the goal of influencing strategic vision, or are you sharing technical steps with peers to get the job done? You need to know the audience's interests and attitudes toward the topic well in advance. Ideally, you'll craft your message that aligns with their interests as much as it does your own. Next, you need to analyze the situation and the physical location. Speakers must be alert to how the occasion dictates tone of the speech, appropriateness of the topic, and overall length of your presentation. To achieve audience-centeredness, we must be willing to adjust the, what we say, suppress some of our own views, and temporarily adopt the views of our listeners in order to make the message as clear and convincing as possible. Now, we need to get set by focusing on our own preparedness. The ultimate measure of preparedness is the ability to speak extemporaneously. This is when you're able to say what you want to say about your topic in your own words with only a brief set of notes. There's two steps in getting prepared. There's rehearsing your content and then planning for questions that might come up afterwards. Rehearsal is the primary way of getting you prepared to speak. Rehearsing addresses nervousness. Rehearsal shifts you from being victimized by nervousness into being vitalized by it. And luckily, there's a five-step method for practicing 
that will help set you up for success. Step one is to write down what you want to say word for word. Read through this full speech outline out loud and judge yourself on how clear and convincing your main points are. Step two is to prepare a speaking outline. This is a visual framework for your speech. It's easy to read at a glance and it includes cues throughout that trigger us to build out those main ideas while we're speaking. Step three is to practice with that speaking outline. If you make a mistake at this step, keep going. The goal is to set, um, excuse me, the goal of this step is to gain control of those main ideas. Step four is rehearse again, but this time in front of a mirror. You want to focus on your eye contact and your mannerisms at this step. And step five is the dress rehearsal. Whenever possible, your final practice session should be under the same conditions as that final event. Test out your technology and have a live audience. Remember, your speech is designed for people. Test it in front of people. Next, planning ahead for questions is a great way to solidify your credibility as a speaker. Here are five tips to ensure that you're ready. Tip one, always view questions from the audience as a sign of genuine interest in your topic. Tip two, give the questioner your full attention. It's really hard to answer a question if you yourself haven't heard it. Tip three, if you are speaking on a topic with technical components, be ready to answer questions in non-technical terms. And tip four, don't try to bluff. Let the person know that you take your, their questions seriously, offer to check in at the answer, and report back to them as soon as possible after the speech. And tip five is stay on track. Allow one follow-up question per person. If someone attempts to ask two or more questions, respond politely but firmly. This is an interesting line of questioning, but we will need to give others a chance to ask their questions and move along. Okay, we got ready by reviewing our audience, and we got set by focusing on our own preparedness. Now it's go time. At go, we turn our attention to our own nonverbal communication. First up is our vocal tone. Remember, we need to make a conscious effort to speak up, slow down, and project clearly. Your volume. Remember your voice always sounds louder to you than it does to your listener. Take cues from people in the back of the room. If they look puzzled or they're leaning forward, volume up. Inflection. Inflection refers to the changes in the highs and lows of our voice. Your goal is to avoid being monotone. That's no highs and lows, maintaining the same tone throughout your speaking. And three is use pauses. Mark Twain said it best, the right words may be effective, but no word was ever as effective as a rightly timed pause. Leverage your silence. Pauses signal the end of a thought and allow your ideas to sink in with your audience. Warning, however, we want to avoid vocalized pauses. These are things like us and hers and ums. These can cause the audience to question the speaker's intelligence. Our next focus is on body language. In this 2400 year old quote from Greek historian, Hero, I always mispronounce this, Hero just sums this up well. People trust their ears less than their eyes. When the speaker's body language is inconsistent with their words, listeners will believe the body language over the words. Pro tip number one is first impressions matter. At the beginning of the speech, stand quietly and calmly in front of your audience to make sure that they're paying attention. Then, and only then, should you start speaking. Tip number two is eye contact. Failing to establish eye contact can be perceived as tentative, insincere, or dishonest. Be sure that you're scanning your audience. Do not gaze intently in one direction while leaving uh, the rest of the room unattended. And tip three are your gestures. Gestures are the motions of the speaker's hands and arms during the speech. 
The goal is to make sure that your hands do not upstage your ideas. Gestures should not distract from your message, and instead, they should help clarify or reinforce your ideas. Now, now that we look the part, our content needs to highlight what we bring to the table. Effective writing and well-articulated speech showcases our dynamic thinking and problem-solving skills. It all starts with the words we use to send our message. Be sure to leverage a vocal vocabulary with a balance of colorful language. Think of your office jargon or that really impressive word that you read in a book once. And balance that with plain language. I like to keep this acronym in mind, KISS. K-I-S-S. Keep it simple, silly. <clears throat> Aside from the words we choose, the structure of your speech demonstrates your organizational skills. If the structure is disjointed and confused, odds are your thinking will be disjointed and confused. A clear and cohesive speech is indicative of a clear mind. A simple organization tactic to remember is, first, tell them what you're going to tell them. Then, Tell them, and finally, tell them what you told them. For a more exact science, train yourself to use a problem, cause, solution, order. Your first points is where you demonstrate the need for the change by showcasing the extent of the seriousness of the problem itself. In your second point, analyze the cause of the problem. And your third points are where you explain your plan for solving the problem and demonstrate why it's the practical solution. So at this point, you have the right words, a cohesive structure. Now it's time to support your case with results. Statistics are a common and effective way of providing quantitative results. Statistics quantify your ideas and give them numerical precision. This can be especially important when you're trying to document the existence of the problem we just talked about. Tip number one is use stats sparingly. Insert statistics only when they're needed and make sure that they're easy to grasp. Tip number two, always state the source of your statistics and clearly relate them back to your argument. Just as effective are qualitative results. I suggest using expert testimonials to help tell your story. These quotes and paraphrases from people who are recognized experts in their field are especially effective when the audience is skeptical and about your point of view. Now for the last piece of the puzzle. Sometimes simply saying our message just doesn't cut it. You'll need to show the audience to get your point across. Using visual aids reinforces a well-crafted message. But, but first, the fine print. There are inherent risks with using visual aids. They can be very distracting. You want to avoid zooming and panning, animated transition effects and sounds. Accepting excessive motion and noises can only distract from your content, your speech. Similarly, the condition coined death by PowerPoint is when the speaker simply reads word for word off of one poorly designed slide after another. You're better off not having the slides to begin with. Issue number two is that visual aids are prone to technical issues and logistics challenges. By a show of hands, who here has experienced technical issues at work? That's everyone. The pro tip here is to set up and test your aids a day in advance whenever possible. Be sure that the aids are large enough and well placed. After all, a visual aid is useless if no one can see it. PowerPoints have become the go-to choice for modern visual aids. The first rule of PowerPoint is that slides should be simple with consistent typeface, colors, and themes. Rule number two of PowerPoint is to limit the amount of text. That's the biggest mistake people make is cramming too much text into a single slide. 
for my pro tip on uh, PowerPoint, remember the three by five rule. That is no more than three lines with five words per, per line per slide. One powerful feature of um, your visual aid is to clarify and complement your statistics, making them easier for the audience to comprehend. And I'm one slide behind, excuse me. This clarification often comes from graphs and charts. Graphs are a visual aid used to show statistical trends and patterns. They come in many shapes and sizes and formats. Line graphs, bar graphs, pie graphs. In contrast, charts are a visual aid to summarize large blocks of information, typically in a list format. We use charts when there are just simply too many categories to effectively display in a graph. <clears throat> Last but certainly not least is the option to incorporate a demonstration or audience participation into your speech as your visual aid. A quote by Chinese philosopher Confucius comes to mind, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. While coordinating uh, demonstrations and participation can be challenging, it is an excellent way to make sure your speech is memorable and ensure your audience understands the message. All right. So how persuasive have I been in the last 15 minutes? By show of hands, who is leaving here with at least one step, tip, or method to improve their own communication at work? Success. We learned how to get ready, get set, and go with steps to prepare for speaking. We reviewed tips for maximizing the impact of our content, and we went over lessons to carefully crafting our visual aids. Your vocabulary, your organization, and cohesive and well-supported main ideas all showcase your existing critical thinking skills while speaking. But the exciting part, part is intentionally working on organizing ideas and using clear and accurate language has been proven to enhance your ability to think clearly and more accurately. For this reason, I'm convinced that verbal confident, confidence is a very important skill to develop in order to advance your career. And I hope that I've persuaded you to consider this too. Thank you very much.